Good evening, ghoulies and ghosties and long-leggedy beasties. This is Alex, coming at you from the underworld, and welcome back to another episode of... With the summer months finally drawing to an end, I want to use this opportunity over the next few weeks to review a few books that are suitable for those months where it is pretty hot outside. And even though with the book I'm reviewing this weekend, it should have been reviewed in the spring because it does take place in the spring, I decided, well, better late than never. So for that reason, I'm reviewing the gothic classic We Have Always Lived in the Castle by Shirley Jackson, which I've read this about three or four times by now, and every time I read it, I fall in love with it all over again. But this time, when I visited the Blackwoods, I brought along a few friends with me, which one of those is my good friend Tiny, and she used to do buddy reads with my belated Aunt Carrie, so by she and I doing this, it really feels like we're keeping a tradition alive. Also, I brought along my friend of 20 years by the name of Connie, who had never read this book before, whereas Tiny and myself, we had already read it a few times. And, of course, as I expected, Connie enjoyed it, and I do wish that I could have both Tiny and Connie on this show, but because of Corona, we're still being, like, just really cautious with everything, and even though Connie and I work together 40 hours a week, and we have taken all of the precautions necessary, we are going to risk it this weekend simply to review this book and have a good time together, which is something we haven't done in months. So without further ado, let's welcome Connie. Hi, my name is Connie, short for Constance. I've known Alex here for many, many years. I really enjoy reading. Some of my favorite authors are James Patterson and Mary Higgins Clark. I also enjoy Looming a lot. Horror is probably my favorite genre, but I'm branching out a lot more. I also enjoy a lot of different television genres as well. Well, now that everyone knows who you are, let's see what happens when you visit the Blackwood family. Oh, would you like some sugar? Yeah, please. Here Thank you, you go. Thanks, Alex. Get you some good spoonfuls there. Thanks, Alex. I know how you like it sweet. I do. All righty. Well, while you're enjoying that, I will talk about our book. Right. Pretty much, the story We Have Always Lived in the Castle by Shirley Jackson is about two sisters by the name of Maricat and Constance Blackwood both of which live with their disabled uncle named Julian. And while they have a very private life, they are actually the talk of the town, which the reason why is because all of these years ago, when they sat down to have dinner, someone spiked their sugar with arsenic. You fool! Because of that, the culprit had ended up poisoning all of the Blackwood family, and the only survivors were Uncle Julian because he simply lucked out, and Maricat had been sent to her bedroom without dinner. Also, Constance does not take sugar with her drinks. So for this reasoning, everyone thinks that Constance is the murderess. Well, regardless of them living a lonely life, one day they have an unexpected visitor who drops in who wants to stay for an extended time. And from here, the story becomes a battle of the wits, with the name of the game being Manipulation. We Have Always Lived in the Castle was published in 1962, where Time Magazine held this work as one of the best ten novels of that year. As far as inspiration goes, Judy Oppenheimer noted in Private Demons that a great deal of this novel's psychology is a reflection of Jackson's own nervous disorders and agoraphobia, and that the personality differences between Maricat and Constance were the yin and yang of Shirley Jackson's inner self. In the past, Jackson openly stated Maricat and Constance were embellished, fictionalized versions of her two daughters. In Monster, she wrote, it is noted that Jackson has an ongoing theme where main characters who are outsiders find themselves in a hostile small-town environment. 
which this was an experience Jackson was familiar with since she never felt accepted by those in the college town she had moved to, especially since she struggled with the roles that were expected of women during this time. And finally, it was rumored that Shirley Jackson was a witch, although she didn't believe in ghosts which, thanks to her interest in the occult, the character Maricat practices a form of synthetic magic, which is used to protect her and the property. And while some of this comes off as nothing more than superstitious, synthetic magic is where artificial objects are manipulated for spellcasting. Fun facts! Here's a few things you may not know about Shirley Jackson. In Monster, she wrote, to show how Jackson wasn't taken seriously, when she was giving birth to her third child, the nurse asked what Jackson's profession was. When Jackson said author, the nurse wrote her down as a housewife. Also, even though Jackson's husband did support her writing, when his career became shattered by her talents, he became resentful and mocked her in front of their friends. To show the impact Jackson has had on literary fiction since 2007, the Shirley Jackson Awards was created which this award ceremony acknowledges outstanding achievement in psychological suspense, horror, and dark fantasy literature. Now for some sad news. Upon the publication of Haunting of Hill House, Jackson had a decline in health where she suffered from asthma, joint pain, dizziness, and heart problems due to heavy smoking. In her later years, Jackson attended therapy in regard to severe anxiety. Due to prescribed barbiturates and amphetamines, this led to her prescription drug abuse. Despite her health problems, Jassy continued to write. We Have Always Lived in the Castle was her final novel before she passed away in 1965. Her cause of death was cardiac arrest. She was only 48. Now that we have that covered, it's time to move on to the spoilers section of this video, which if you've never read this book before, we're going to discuss some things that could ruin the experience for you. So if you wish to skip this section, just scroll down to the comments and you'll notice that I have a pinned comment at the top where there's a timestamp available. So if you were to click on that, it would redirect you to the thoughts section of this video. Now, you only have 17 seconds to do this, so... No, ready, set, go! Since everyone has had the opportunity to click away, we want to talk about some of our favorite moments. Yes. Which, the first moment I want to talk about is the scene where we see inside Maricat's mind for the first time. Yeah. And with this, you see just how depraved she is and how twisted she is. And, like, if she had the opportunity to do this, you know she would not think twice. Not twice. Like, what happens is she walks into a grocery store and everyone's just minding their own business. And all of a sudden she has this sick fantasy that everyone starts to die. And as they're gasping for their last breath, she walks over to them and starts kicking them. <laughs> And then she just nonchalantly steps over their writhing bodies to get the groceries that she wants. And my she goes nothing. on about her day. My nothing. And I mean, I think I've had this fantasy before. <laughs> <laughs> but no, seriously, like the scene, it's kind of comedic because it's so outlandish. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's really disturbing because really. you see how twisted this girl is. And you also realize that we're working with a time bomb here. Definitely. Now, what was your favorite scene? My favorite scene is when Mary Cat goes outside to ask trolls to leave. Yes. Yes. Because you have these two narcissistic characters going toe-to-toe, -to -toe and it doesn't disappoint. Like, you had Charles on one side, who was using Constance to get to the family treasure and jewels. Then the other side, you got Mary Cat who cannot let go of her fantasy and obsession of her, of her Constance. And then he had uh, their final encounter at the end where Charles tells her, I wonder which of us will still be here. And that just makes Mary Cat mad. And that uh, this is upstanding. And, you know, I really like that scene because it shows what happens when two crazies meet. Yes, crazy and, make crazy. 
And, you know, we've been in that circumstance before. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, yes, we have. We, we, we feel sorry for Constance for I, that. I do feel sorry for Constance. <laughs> Poor Constance. Now, I do want to mention this scene before we get to the tea time segment. This mm -hmm. time we're doing it without sugar. But mm -hmm. I really love the ending of this book. Me too. Like, it's iconic. Mm -hmm. And it's something that's unforgettable. Because, yeah. like, what goes down is Mary Cat has set a fire to their home just to drive away Charles. Right. And in the process of doing this, she's willing to lose everything just to get rid of him. And so that speaks a lot right there. It does. But then what becomes so unforgettable about this is you have where Mary Cat and Constance run outside of the house because it's on fire. Right. Well, the villagers show up and they are just screaming, let it burn. Well, the fireman puts out the fire because yeah. that's their obligation. Right. But then the firemen and the villagers, they pick up stones and they just start bashing out the windows and they raid the home and destroy everything. Yeah. And even some of the villagers are wanting to injure Constance and Marikat. Mm -hmm. Now, Constance has agoraphobia. Right. And also their uncle Julian just, just died, died because of this. Just died. And I just put myself in Constance's shoes. Mm -hmm. And I think to myself, if that were me... I would probably have to go to like an insane asylum oh, or something too. afterwards me because, too. I mean, she's taken out of her comfort zone, mm -hmm. surrounded by violence. Mm -hmm. And in death, it, more death. It's just iconic. Mm -hmm. But what I really found interesting about that scene, too, is mm -hmm. it shows really like the mob mentality. Yeah. And how, like, purging anger can really bring like a new because right. that's what eventually happens. It is. So that was really cool. It was cool. Now, I'm not going to rant like how I usually do, but Mary Cat, even though she was as nutty as a shithouse squirrel, <laughs> I was still surprised that she murdered her whole family. Like, really? Yeah, a small part of me kind of expected it to really be Constance, but then at the end when Mary Cat admitted to doing what she did, I was like, makes sense. Because, <laughs> I mean, the thing is, up until that moment, she had only, like, just meditated on things. She had only right. fantasized about, about things. It. And even with, like, Charles, the things she did to him, even burning down the house, for God's sake, mm -hmm. that's still something different than actually murdering someone. That's true. And so, until the words actually came out of her mouth, I stayed on the fence about it. Well, she's not guilty until proven guilty. Right. So, that that was pretty cool. Now, what did you think about it? Like, when you first saw the movie or read the book, did you really think that Mary Cat was guilty from the start? Yes. Okay. I did. I mean, her mental state was a clue for me, for one. And then, like, the scene where she's fantasizing about the perfect family, how they're all Mary Cat, Mary Cat, the perfect child, We're not Mary worthy. Cat. We're not <laughs> worthy, Mary Cat. You should never get in trouble, Mary Cat. Which contradicts. You know, but Con Constance has said before about her being a wicked child. Yes. And truth be it, Constance, in my opinion, is not a bad person. She's right. an enabler. Right. But she's she not a bad person. America. Now, this kind of brings us to another discussion topic. Okay, so the thing is, like, as I'm reading this book, we see that Mary Cat is totally a sociopathic <laughs> narcissist. Yes. And... Eventually, it comes to be that her goal is to create her fantasy land into a reality, the moon. which is their house on the moon, right. which that is their house away from anything and everything. Everybody. No one exists there except the two the of them thing. and Uncle Julian. She finally gets around to saying an Uncle Julian. So, I should be kinder to Uncle Julian. Yeah, yeah. And the thing is, we see that this little sociopathic bitch here has totally been pulling the strings from the beginning. She's been manipulating the hell out of her sister. Every time Constance wants to go into town or make the attempt to conquer her agoraphobia. Have a friend. Yes. Mary Cat sabotages that. Everything. And she's like, no, you don't need to go to town. And even when they do have some people over that actually do care for them... You have where America just sabotages it. Gets where, mad. Yes. 
mm-hmm. where they just can't have a civil conversation. A normal. They she ends life. up screwing it up for Constance right. entirely. And so that's how I saw it, and mm-hmm. I did not think anything differently once right. she did admit to being the killer of her family. Right. However, the name of the game is manipulation here, but our friend Tiny, her mother, said that when she read this, she thought that Constance was actually the puppeteer, and she had been pulling the strings from the beginning, and she had, had like accidentally trapped herself Because what happened was she was urging for Mary Cat to do certain things, nudging her to go in a certain direction, and Mary Cat just took on to that. Mm, Silly Mary Cat. And then, all of a sudden, Constance is trapped. Now, some of her reasonings for thinking this is because, in the book, you have where Constance even breaks down a few times and says, this is all my My fault. fault. And, I mean, they are major breakdowns where she blames herself for for everything. everything. Mm -hmm. And then also at the same time, like, when I read this, I really saw where Constance was saying this in a way where she was just trying to brush the subject off. Mm -hmm. That way there wouldn't be any arguments between Mary Cat and Charles. Mm -hmm. But then when someone else read it, they felt like her response was more so... Passive aggressive, like, mm-hmm. oh, silly Mary Cat, yeah. silly mm-hmm. Mary Cat, we have to do what Charles says. And so her thoughts were Constance was the puppeteer from the beginning, and she had created a monster in Mary Cat, which caused her to become trapped in the end. Mm-hmm. Which, of course, you know, Mary Cat does manifest the house on the moon in a reality in their own home. Mm-hmm. But what are your thoughts? Like, do you think that maybe Constance was guilty and, like, she trapped herself? I think a case could be made for it. I mean, she did say on more than one occasion, this is all my fault. And she knew she did not take sugar. Everybody knew Constance did not take sugar. Julian knew, Mary Kat knew, everybody knew Constance did not want sugar on her food. Mm-hmm. Well, with that said... And that being the possibility that, you know, it could be. I still think that, you know, it was all just Mary Cat, but... I think so. I I'm, think it's more just Mary Cat. Yeah, and, uh, but I'm not, I'm not going to discredit the idea. Right, because it, it, it's a good theory. I mean, it is. A case can be made for it. It is. Now, as far as talking about manipulators, let's talk about our favorite bastard here. Charles. <laughs> now, don't you have a few things to say about Charles? Charles was a fool. Charles was a greedy, narcissistic, money hungry, <laughs> just wanted to climb the family ladder. Wanted to get all the riches. All of the riches, idiot. No redeeming qualities. No, <laughs> no redeeming qualities. And you can see it too with him trying to, to take the daddy's place, like sitting at the head of the table. Sleeping in a daddy's room, wearing his things and all this and that. You know, the he watch. wanted the, the watch. He wanted to be the head macho. He wanted the family treasure. He wanted to. All right, the book is called "We Have Always Lived in the Castle." He wanted the castle. He wanted to be the king of the castle. He wanted it all. He, yes, he wanted it all. And you know what? I think I dated a few guys like Charles. <laughs> 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 oh God, but. The thing is with Charles is he does it with such charisma. He is very charismatic. I don't, I don't get the full dad. He's charismatic. He and, was moving constant so hard, trying to anyway. And, Talk about their plane. And and I mean the thing is like this is a prime example that psychopaths or sociopaths can be extremely charismatic, and that's how you fall into their trap. Like Ted Bundy. Exactly. He was very charismatic. That's how he got women in his cars and stuff. And the sleaze that this asshole has, too, because at the end (laughs) of the book, like, when the two sisters are in their home, they're not communicating with anyone, Charles comes up to the house and tries to manipulate them. Then to open the door, and Charles says, I'm not going to come back. Yes. Don't come back. He uses that as like, this is your last chance. Right. Answer now or you'll never see, see me, me again. again. Well, good riddance bye. to bad bye, rubbish. Bye, Felicia. Bye, bye, bye. <laughs> <laughs> and the thing is, even at the end of this, the only reason why he was trying to get in that house again 
was because he had that journalist with him who wanted to get a photo of the sisters. And sell it for money. Yes, that was it. That's exactly it. Trifling ass mother. Overall, I really enjoyed We Have Always Lived in the Castle. And one of the things I really liked about this is it feels like an origin story. It does. Like, even before the ending of this book comes and it turns into what feels like an urban legend, we yeah. see all of the telltale signs. We do. Like, even when Maricat goes to the village, she has that little poem that the kids <laughs> sing about her. It's like, um... Mary Cat said, Constance, would you like a cup of tea? Oh, no, said Mary Cat. You'll, You'll poison, poison me. me. <laughs> so we have that. And then without giving away spoilers, by the time the book ends, the sisters and the home have become urban legends. Yeah. And even though the adults of the town start treating the sisters with kindness and such, yeah. you do have one or two parents who give the, off the whole little idea to their misbehaving kids mm -hmm. that if you don't do right, then the Blackwood sisters will come out and eat you. And that urban legend kind of flourishes among the kids. It does. And it becomes that house where you avoid, mm -hmm. and the Blackwoods become those spinster hermits that right. you tell stories about. Mm -hmm. And I think every town has kind of like that bad place home I and bad so place too. person. I think so, too. So it was really cool to see it transform into that. Mm -hmm. And also, I think it was a really great character study. It was. Uh, it really makes you look at family dynamics and makes you examine the characters or motivations and all of it. My favorite character is, is probably Uncle Julian. Yes. I love Uncle Julian. Even though he has dementia, all these things happening, he remembers he hates Charles. He never forgets he hates Charles. With His a hate, passion. With a passion. His hate, Charles hates the strong. He never forgets it. And I, I, I love to hate Mary Cass. She's just a great character to love to hate. It's like you have to love to hate Mary Cat you because to. you she's a fun character where it's like what kind of crazy crap is she about to do now? I know, I know. And I and then there, there's Charles who I just hate. There's nothing good about Charles. He's a sign ball. There's nothing redeeming about Charles. I just simply hate Charles. I do love Constance though. You can't help but love Constance. You can't. I mean, she just broke my heart as a character. Mm -hmm. And as far as character development goes, I mean, all of the characters in this are very layered. They're strong, very layered. strong characters. Very. And what I noticed about the four main characters is that it all shows a different kind of mental illness with mm -hmm. them. Like you have Maricat and Charles, who are both sociopaths. Yeah. Then you have Constance, who has agoraphobia. Mm -hmm. And then you also have Uncle Julian, who has dementia. Yeah. So those are some pretty good discussion topics. It and really is. It, it allows you to really see kind of like the mindset of what goes down when mental illness is just kind of being focused on right. with a small group of people. I agree. And aside from that, like, what other topics did you notice? I, like, crime and punishment, you know, all the, the guilt Constance was feeling, her persecution, and, mm -hmm. and love it. I agree. And the thing is, with the whole persecution part, mm -hmm. that is so strong in this book. But also, as I said, mental illness right. is another strong topic, and so is obsession. Yeah. And, but persecution, that's really a good subject to talk about, because... Mm -hmm. We see what the Blackwood sisters go through yeah. with the persecution. Mm -hmm. But Especially then, Constance. oh yes, oh yes. And then at the same time, we see like the other side of it where there's the whole mob mentality that oh, yeah. comes. Mm -hmm. And after the destruction from that mob is purged from their systems, mm -hmm. we see that there's the need to atone mm -hmm. and start anew yeah. and try to mend those burnt bridges, you know. Right, so, bringing them food and stuff. That was really interesting to talk about and also something to consider. Mm -hmm. But um, at the end of the day, did the book scare you or creep you out? It really didn't scare or creep me out. I mean, it held my attention the entire time. It had me by the edge of my seat. It was suspenseful, but it didn't like creep me out. I agree. It didn't scare or creep me out either, but it was something where I could not put it down. Right. And it was really a good gothic thriller. It really is. We Have Always Lived in the Castle is a gothic psychological thriller that I think horror fans will enjoy because even though it's not a horror book, it is still dark fiction and it totally caters to the fandom. 
Now, I do also believe that this is suitable for adults and young adults because nothing in this is overtly graphic. And with this being a book that I've returned to time and time again, yes, I highly recommend this as it's one of my favorite books. What about you? What do you think? I highly recommend it too. I, I love the story. It has great characters, great character development. I mean, it has murder, obsession, betrayal. It has everything. It has something for everyone. What more can a reader ask for? On to the questions. My first question is, what is a horror book you would recommend about siblings? Load up the comments. My second question is, if you've read the book and seen the movie to We Have Always Lived in the Castle, what did you think of the movie adaptation? Pretty much, I really enjoyed the movie adaptation because it did a good job of casting and also staying true to the story, but there was a difference at the end, which, truth be it, I think worked better for the movie. But right. what did you think? I agree. I mean, I loved the book and I loved the movie too. The movie, the people who did the movie did a very good job staying pretty true to the book. The casting was spot on. The the, product, the whole production of it, the house, all of it was, they did a great job. Mm -hmm. And I, I agree about the ending. The ending in the movie worked very well. It was a little different from the book, but it worked. All right. Well, with that said, I just want to say thank you for coming on. It was so fun to have you. Thank you for having me. Of course, of course. And hopefully we can have you back in the future. Absolutely. Now that it's time to wrap up the video, I would like to give a special shout out to Lisa G, Joseph Baylot, and Melody Romeo, which Melody Romeo writes fantasy fiction and also historic fantasy, and you can find her books in print and ebook wherever books are sold. And if you're wondering why I'm giving a shout out to these wonderful people, it's because they've been gracious enough to contribute to my Patreon account, which if you would like to contribute to my Patreon as well, for $5 a month, I'll give you a shout out at the end of my videos. And for $10 a month, I'll give you that same shout out. Plus, I'll send you over one of my photos, which I do creepy photography on the side, and you'll receive that photo at the beginning of every month. Also, if you are a creator of some sort, I will mention what it is you create and how people can find your work, such as what I did with Miss Romeo. And if you would like to hunt me down on social media, links to my Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok are all in the description section of this video, so feel free to hit me up. And if you haven't subscribed yet, be sure to subscribe and click that notifications bell because I have tons of more great book reviews coming in the near future. And until we see each other again, I hope you have a wonderful week and...